All right, so yesterday, uh, Dungeons & Dragons YouTube channel put out their video on the 2024 Dungeon Master's Guide, which is set to come out November 12th. I have not seen this video yet, so let's watch it together and see what they have to say. So we have a new Dungeon Master's Guide. Tell me about what is new and exciting in this new DMG. Cool so art. this new DMG, uh, the new Dungeon Master's Guide, is a chance for us to apply some That's of the really feedback cool that we've gotten on the Dungeon Master's Guide that came out in 2014 and to do some things we didn't have the time for <laughs> or the budget for uh, last time. Uh, and one of the key philosophical things was remembering that this book should be, ought to be, the Dungeon Master's best friend. It should feel like the book that the Dungeon Master considers to be indispensable when they're creating content for them. Now, <laughs> that's a funny thing to say to me because a lot of a lot of Dungeon Masters that I've spoken to um, have never read the entirety of the Dungeon Master's Guide for 5e, the 2014 one. Um, and that's okay. It's okay to, to pick and choose what you read, um, to, to just kind of read what you need for, for each individual time. I personally have read it front to back more times than I care to count and than I care to admit to. Uh, and I always recommend people read it start to finish just so that you know you for sure know all of the rules. But you're never going to remember everything. It's just it's just too much. You, it, you can't expect yourself or anyone else to remember everything. But you have a better chance of retaining it so you don't have to stop in the middle of a campaign or in the middle of a combat to look something up to make sure you're doing everything right if you've read it start to finish at least once the some of the the niche rulings will get stuck in your head i promise and when they come up in game you're more likely to remember them and not have to try and find them but it's okay to not read it start to finish to just go to the table of contents whenever something comes up so i, I wouldn't call the old dungeon master's guide any dungeon master's best friend um <laughs> but teach their own for their games or when they're running their games and so we went back and took a look at the 2014 book and said okay what parts of this book are delivering on that philosophy and what parts of this book aren't those conversations led us to restructure the book so that it's easier to find the information that you need that it's more intuitive in terms of the order in which the information is presented and adding things to the book that would be more timeless and always useful to Dungeon Masters. So uh, first and foremost, the Dungeon Master's Guide is bigger. Like all of the revised 5th edition books, we have added pages to the book. Things that were not in the 2014 book that are in this book include five short sample adventures, a complete campaign setting, a... Oh, no lore glossary, which is a place where we gather up sort of encyclopedia style entries on various characters, locations, and um, substances in Dungeons and Dragons that you I love that right off the bat, starting off strong in my books. I love anything lore related. Um, so for the Dungeon Master to be then Master's Guide to be opening up with uh, with something like that. You get all of this lore, which is something that, in my opinion, the old Dungeon Master's Guide was lacking. Like, it had some lore references. Uh, you know, when you're when you're reading layers, when you're reading about um, you know uh, different um, uh, settings like the the Nine Hells, or you know, it, it has lore, but it, it was missing bigger chunks of lore. It could have had more uh so the fact that they're opening up the lore glossary is <laughs> Mwah, chef's kiss i love it already may or may not know about and another totally new feature of this book is the bastions chapter oh. those things alone the adventure content the campaign setting the lore glossary and the bastions chapter that's all new content that we wanted to get into this book and that's why the book is one of the reasons why the book is bigger. Why it is so chunky? It's a chunky, chunky book. Yes, <laughs> exactly. We've got 
tons of new art for magic items. More magic items are illustrated now than in 2014, so there's more so things you can see what they look like. There's a couple of places where we weren't super satisfied with the way a magic item looked. Um, and so we redid those. Our art director, Emmy, uh, put together a, a lineup of all the potion art we had, just so you could see them all together. There's a couple of, of really sweet pieces in there. Some sort of inside jokes, like the potion of, inv of invisibility. It looks like an empty bottle. <laughs> And the potion of pugilism bears a certain resemblance to canned spinach. Oh, perfect. Yes. Great. So one of the chapters of the book is called Creating Adventures, and it's all about how... Helping the DM create adventures. The advice that we give is, is very different advice than we'd give to somebody who is trying to basically publish their own content. Because when you're creating content for yourself, and you are the audience, uh, there are tips and tricks that we can give you to help you do that. But all the advice aside, nothing compares to being able to see the advice being implemented. So after giving you a bunch of advice on how you can create your own adventure content for your home groups, we present five short adventures in a format that we think DMs will want to emulate and use for their own prep. Accompanied by... That is, that is a bold claim. I've, I know that there are lots of DMs out there that run things similar to each other, run things, uh, create their campaigns similar to uh, campaign modules, but those are small in numbers, I should say. The vast majority of, of DMs that enjoy making their own campaigns, we do it so vastly different. Um, I do love that they, they've got a bigger section on how to make your own campaign. That's great. Um, it, the old Dungeon Master's Guide, while they did have tips for for running campaigns that you could loosely translate into making your own campaign, it felt more like they were trying to be like, don't forget to buy more of our campaign modules to play, right? Uh, <laughs> so the fact that they're embracing our imagination as Dungeon Masters to help us create more compelling campaigns is fantastic uh this is already in my opinion better than the than the player's handbook which i do have not on hand but i have it <laughs> I, I do have videos coming up on it real soon here but there this has already inspired more confidence than the player's handbook did when we were going over that so this is great by the maps that are in uh, one of the appendices of the book these adventures are meant to show you how you can create and outline your own adventure content in a way that uh, will be very easy for you to run at the table. Most of the adventures are about a half a page. Doesn't seem like a lot, but you can actually pack a lot of information yeah, into a half page if you're the person who's going to be running the adventure. Yeah, like that's the way... I'm sure you don't format your entire, when you're running no. your own home game, you're not like formatting everything appropriately. <laughs> no, when I'm running my home game, yeah. I essentially have a piece of paper that has notes yeah. and, and key beats. And then I have whatever maps and stat blocks I need to run encounters. Okay, okay. That's kind of the philosophy the behind these adventures that, is they're skeletal sure. in a way, but they have all the information that you need to feel confident that you'll be able to play with your friends. So we have a, we have a level one adventure, level two adventure, level three, and then I think it, we have a couple gaps and then uh, some higher level content in there as well. Uh, and I mentioned that these adventures are designed for use with maps. Uh, there yeah. is in the 2014 DMG, we did have an appendix of maps. We've Kinda. redone that appendix, bad. created a bunch of wholly new maps Good. that oh. we think are more versatile and useful over and over and over. These are <laughs> these these ones that I paused on are very simplistic, but they're still looking a lot better than the appendices of maps in the original DMG or not original 2014 DMG. Um, that was just pitiful, and in my opinion, they were pretty much unusable Heck, oh no that's the monster's manual i thought i had it i thought i had it with me um i don't it's probably on my table across the room anyway um they are not good maps they are pretty pretty bad maps in fact um uh, <laughs> 
I don't recommend ever using the maps in the back of the 2014 DMG. I've seen people do it, and they, they work in a pinch, but they're not good. These these are okay. These are passable. Um, but if they redid all the maps and they put new maps in there, you got to think, statistically speaking, there's going to be good maps in this DMG. Over again. And those adventures refer to some of those maps. And then there are additional maps in the appendix nice. that we don't use in the adventures that you as a DM can just take and make your own. Nice. You've just ha handed everyone a toolbox for running an adventure in a few minutes. Correct. That's what I love boxes. about that. Yeah. Yeah, you have these boxes. adventure hooks for various levels that you could implement yourself. And then you have maps that are attached to those. But then you have other maps as well. This really feels like it's giving people the freedom to just jump into dungeon mastering so much faster. I got I, I to gotta stop again and talk about maps. Look, maps are some of the hardest things to deal with when it comes to making your own campaign. Making a map, uh, even just if it's just a floor plan, is not easy, right? Um, we're not <laughs> we're not architects, right? We didn't go we didn't go to, to college for architecture to learn how to make make floor plans and shit like that, right? That's not that's not what most of us do for a living, right? I I'm a maintenance technician. I fix broken things. Like I don't, I don't know how to build a building, right? So making maps is difficult. It can be difficult. Plotting out maps can be difficult. Whether it's uh, mapping out a building, you know, three floors of this mansion or dungeon, or mapping out a cave system, or even just a forest trail, it can be tricky. It can be rough. Um, and so the fact that they've got so many maps, supposedly, we'll see. The fact that they've got a bunch of maps for us to use, including maps that aren't part of their their little mini campaigns, uh, is super helpful. Especially to new Dungeon Masters that are new to making their own campaign. Uh, I love that they're finally giving us more freedom. And that's, that is something I will always stand behind. Than I've ever had published before in D&D. Exactly. Throughout the Adventures chapter, there's all sorts of advice, tables, and other things that are designed to be used. We were very careful in making sure, and we, we, we had consultants join us on this journey to make sure that the content, the advice we're giving you for creating adventures and the sample adventures were actually things that DMs will be like, yeah, this, right. this is how I want to do this, and this is, this is not as hard as I thought it might be. And if you are an experienced Dungeon Master who has created a lot of adventure content for your That's, home games, I'm sure you'll find some things that. in the chapter that are uh, affirming and yeah. val validating. <laughs> uh, in addition to some other useful stuff, like just sort of evergreen stuff that you can plunder, like the maps. Perfect. For each kind of stage of the, of the planning process, we give you just tons of ideas. There's tables of adventure hooks that are broken out by the tier of play. So levels one to four, five to 10, 11 to 16, 17 plus. You can see how the stakes escalate in those adventure hooks. I say adventure hooks and really I mean the situations that are going on because then there's a separate section on here's hooks that will draw characters into those situations. We tried to separate those concepts a little bit. The sample adventures just kind of show all of that in practice and they range from a pretty straightforward, there's a corruption in the forest, go find the source and kill it, <laughs> to there's a fairy ball and you have to persuade the baron of the ball to give you his blessing. The campaign setting. <laughs> yes. So in the 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide, there was a chapter on campaigns, maybe the first or second chapter of the book. Calling that a chapter is... It's got to be criminal. It, it's like three pages that kind of loosely go over campaigns. I could be wrong on the number of pages. It's Like I said, I've read the book start to finish several times, more than several, but it has been a hot minute since the last time I read through it. Uh, it's probably more than three pages, but it's, it's such a small section that calling it a chapter has got to be criminal. It's just got to be. It's not helpful at all. It, I hope that, that they're about to tell us that... Uh, they uh, pumped it up. They redid it completely, and now it's you know useful. It th really just sort of threw you into the deep end. Yeah. Um, in the 2024 DMG, uh, we have some earlier chapters that are giving you information about what it means to be a dungeon master and sort of uh, tricks of the trade and whatnot. We've moved the campaigns chapter to later in the book. Um, it follows the creating an adventures chapter, or creating okay. adventures chapter. Makes sense. Um, 
the reason for pushing it deeper into the book was we don't expect new DMs particularly to immediately jump into campaign creation. Yeah, yeah. they should. Until they kind of understand what DMing is all about and how they find players and the things that they need to play and how they help their players build their characters and build a, a cohesive party, things like that. But when you are ready to build a campaign, this chapter does, I think, a, a very good job, a much better job of giving you advice that is really useful and showing you how what a campaign looks like by giving you an example of one, which no previous Dungeon Master's Guide has ever tried to do. No previous Dungeon Master's Guide Good. included a complete campaign setting. This is the first one to do so. All right, so moving it back further in the book is a is good idea, right? I am i don't care either way on where this, this particular chapter is at, because whether you're a new DM or a veteran DM, I still feel like you should read it start to finish before you run your next campaign. Before you run your first campaign with the 2024 book, uh, I'm sorry, the, the two 2024 books and the one 2025 book, because Monster Manual's not coming out until 2025. Uh -huh. Before you run your first campaign with these books, you should read the Dungeon Master's Guide. Start to finish. Whether you're a new DM or a veteran DM, you should. Obviously, I don't care if you do or not. I'm going to. I think everybody should. Um, so its placement is kind of kind of irrelevant in, in that regard. However, it does belong after um, after you know the learning how to run a campaign. It it absolutely does. You shouldn't be learning how to make a campaign before you learn how to run a campaign. Um, and yeah, a, a new a new DM for those of you who are watching who want to start DMing with the twenty twenty four rules and stuff because they're just now coming out. Great, fantastic. Thank you. We need more DMs. I love you. Do not start with making your own campaign. If you are a new DM, do not start with making your own campaign. Um, I can't stress that enough because you might might not like being a DM. Uh, you may not like the responsibilities that come with it because it's not it's not just oh let me just read from this book. Let me just read all of the notes I've written. Right? It's it. There's a certain responsibility that comes with it. You have to be able to keep your party, your group on track, without making them feel railroaded, right? You, they have to have the freedom to do the things that they want to do, but you also have to be able to keep them going on the the storyline, on the plot line. And it's not easy, and it could cause friction between players, and you need to be able to deal with the friction between players. It's a lot of responsibility that not a lot of people are ready for when they first step into it. And it becomes a lot more difficult when it's a homebrewed campaign and not like a campaign module that, you know, has a specific start to finish. So, absolutely, new DMs should not be making their own campaign for the first, I'd say, three campaigns. Um, especially since there are so many, there are so many um, short campaigns that you can get practice running through. Um, so, but at the same time, if you feel like you can do it, if you feel like you can handle the responsibility of being a DM, absolutely make your own campaign. Uh, I'll have some tips and tricks going for it. Once this DM's guide comes out, I'll make some 2024 slash 2025 specific tips and tricks that maybe the DMG leaves out. We'll, we'll see because I can't say that for sure until I see the DMG in November. It's irritating. But, yeah, no, it, it's placements irrelevant. Um, but it, it sounds like this particular chapter is thicker. So the campaign setting chapter is going to be useful now. Because it was absolutely useless in the 2014 DMG. Right. And we chose the campaign setting very carefully. Um, this is D&D's 50th anniversary. Yeah. These books are a celebration of that anniversary. And we thought... The best campaign setting. <laughs> These books are, are a celebration of the 50th anniversary. That's why one of them's coming out when done <laughs> in 2025 instead of 2024, right? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, for this uh, book assholes. is the Greyhawk setting. And for those oh, who don't hello. know, 
Hello. This is a beautiful map. I like this map. Hello. Let's see if Garnet, Wooly Bay, one more bay. Nerdiv, <laughs> Lake of Unknown Depths. That sounds like a great way to get to the Underdark to me. Hello. This is a beautiful map. I I love everything about this map right now. Like looking at this, this this is I love this. I couldn't I couldn't be happier. Okay. Like whew, whew, whew. Oh, Greyhawk is the first oh, official and Dungeons more. and Dragons it's, campaign. Yeah, setting. keep panning it is out an for old me. and very yeah, beloved baby. place that oh, has given rise to some of beautiful. our greatest heroes from Tasha to Mordenkainen, and enemies from Igwilv to Ayuz. There's also something lovely about the first campaign that you hand someone in the Dungeon Master's Guide is the first campaign. Yes, and the thing that I loved about Greyhawk when I first discovered it back in whatever it was, 1980, I guess, <laughs> um, is how customizable it is. The original Greyhawk Gazetteer was a very thin product. It gave you an entire campaign setting in about 32 pages with two big fold-out maps. When I read it, there was a lot of material in there I wouldn't have used because there was some wargaming stuff in there as well. Uh, but I was struck by how sort of open and free it is, how liberating it was. It didn't put any uh, constraints on me as a DM. I felt from an instant that the creators wanted me to take this, wanted me to take this setting and make it my own. And um, staying true to that, the version of Greyhawk that appears in the 2024 Dungeon Master's Guide, uh, while it's complete, it's also, um, you know, due to the space that we have, it's a, it's a skeleton upon which we expect you to flesh things out. We have purposely left the details of Greyhawk pretty vague. Uh, our starting point for that whole section was the original World of Greyhawk folio, which was really just an alphabetical listing of all these countries. We pulled back from there to, to focus more on the city of Greyhawk and then talk in, in broad terms about the regions of the, the surrounding world and um, importantly, the, the themes and major conflicts that, uh, that can drive adventures in the world. So the threat of Ayuz in the north, the threat of evil dragons and Tiamat, or the threat of elemental evil, which is this constant recurring theme in the world of Greyhawk. Um, and the starter adventures, to some degree, touch on those. If you want to uh, pull those out from the adventures and stretch them into a theme that can last for a whole campaign. What we do is we give you a poster map in the book that has the world of Greyhawk wilderness on one side and the city of Greyhawk on the other. Uh, because we use the city of Greyhawk as a sample of what a campaign hub mm. can be. A campaign hub is sort of the where the campaign starts, it's kind of its center, its core. And while campaigns can often drift away into new hubs and go off in strange directions, we thought it was very important that we not only give you a campaign setting, but give you an example of a campaign hub, a place where the characters can call their home, where you can use as a launching point for adventures in that world. We describe the city of Greyhawk. We flesh out some of its um, places and inhabitants. And we give you a whole bunch of hooks and ways to use this city as a hub in your campaign. And then we go out. That's fantastic. See, for new DMs that want to make their own campaign, they've given you, a, like they said, a, a campaign hub. You can use the city of Greyhawk as your starting point. That way you don't have to try and make up all these names for cities. You don't have to try and map out the, a city, you know, and you just spread out from there to wherever you want to go make up your own city from there or your own areas outside of, of Greyhawk city from there. Uh, this is something that that's fantastic. A lot of, a lot of people like to use Baldur's Gate in the, in the 2014, uh, homebrews, uh, Neverwinter, um, um, uh, oh my God. City names are escaping me right now. There's a lot of cities in, in the, 2014 DMG uh, campaign setting area uh, that that you can use, and they're while they're great, th there's not like a whole lot of like mapping or information about in, in the DMG. You have to go looking elsewhere. Uh, 
So this seems to be a lot better right off the bat. And this is a great way for new DMs to dip their toes into uh, making their own campaigns. So I love this. And I mean, that map was just absolutely beautiful. The the map of the city, the, the over overview, I should say, of the entire city was fantastic. So it's great. Beyond that, we go into the regions around the city and we describe what are some of the... Um, nearby areas of interest because in a campaign as soon as you strike out from the hub you need places to go dungeons in the hills or you know threats in the forest that kind of thing we flesh that out and then we go even broader and show you the rest of the land known as eastern Oric or the flaneus this vast region around the city of greyhawk that's got it's got nations it's got wildernesses it's got mountain ranges it's got all kinds of territories, land masses to explore, different environments from deserts to Arctic cold. We flesh out all of those oh, domains to the extent oh. that we believe DMs need to get sort of a lay of the land, but at the life. same time yeah, saying, hey DM, yeah. now that we've given you this, make it your own. Yeah. You know, put your dungeon here if you want to, um, you know, add a town here if you want to, yeah. uh, that kind of thing. It's very much built on the idea of um, we're giving you a sandbox. Yeah. We're throwing some toys in and we're saying, go play. Yeah. Love Greyhawk sandboxes. is yours now. Love toys. It is. Yes. That's, that's a great way to say it. Greyhawk is yours. Um, and because of its legacy, uh, you, you get the sense that, oh, if I'm going to build my adventures in my, if I'm going to create my own version of Greyhawk, I can create, um, you know, locations that have as much weight to them or importance to them of some of the greatest locations that have ever appeared in D&D before. Tomb of Horrors originated, you know, had a place in Greyhawk. The Lost Caverns of Sajkhan had a place in Greyhawk. Your dungeons are just as welcome there as those uh, very famous iconic ones. Your heroes, your villains are just as welcome there as Greyhawk's most iconic ones. The other great thing about Greyhawk is um, because it is the origin of so much of D&D's lore, it feels right for these books because we have spells in the player's handbook <laughs> that are you. named after people who came from Greyhawk. Yeah. Um, we have monsters in the monster manual that originated. Oh, the know, monster manual that doesn't uh, and, come out next year? Sort of cool. first, found their first I'll homes take your word for it, I guess. in Greyhawk. Uh, so it's deeply, deeply, deeply embedded into the DNA of D&D. The next element I want to talk about is the lore glossary. There are two appendices in the book. One is yeah, maps, one is the lore glossary. The lore glossary is an alphabetical listing of some of the most famous places, figures, yeah, and uh, materials that are so iconic to D&D that we want them to be shared. It's like the fifth time they've shown Tiamat. I mean, all the other times it's been within the, the uh, Evil Sorcerer's Crystal Ball. Uh, I, I, I think they're going to, to rewrite uh, uh, the, the Tyranny of Dragons. Tyranny of Dragons, uh, which is a fantastic campaign module. And that's coming from me, someone who hates campaign modules. Uh, maybe they won't rewrite Tyranny of Dragons. Maybe they'll just make a new campaign module involving Tiamat. Uh, Tiamat is is one of the coolest BBEGs. Um, she is a vile monstrosity. <laughs> Great way to test your player's patience. Um, I, I love the fact that I love just the thought that they're putting into people's heads with, with all of the pictures of Tiamat that they've put throughout the DMG, or at least they're showing in this video. It really drives home that they, they might be bringing her back uh, in a bigger role. Knowledge among all D&D players of all ages. This is helpful to us because often in our published adventures and elsewhere, we will casually name drop something like Orcus or Morden Canaan or... Lolf, or the Demon Web Pits, or you know, um, Baldur's Gate. Well, everybody knows Baldur's Gate now. But now yeah. they do. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the Dungeon Master's Guide 2024, we want to make sure that there are places in the book that tell you where these places are, Lord what these places are, who these people are, et cetera, and so forth. What is Mithril is in d, &D? What is Adam in d, &D? Oh, That that's kind of perfect. thing. The lore glossary captures a lot of that lore that many of us old timers have embedded in our heads, yeah. <laughs> but a lot of D&D &D players don't. 
Yeah. And so this is just an easy, quick reference guide for people who are looking for information about this mysterious thing they've just stumbled upon. Sort of a who's who uh, for D&D. &D. It is very much like that. Yes, absolutely. With some nice art pieces sprinkled in. That stuff oh, very nice appeals to me. Pieces. No matter how much I already know, I just like reading oh, exactly. like a little bit of the lore of yeah, all those people. And a lot of the lore comes from every past seeder. edition as well. well we, were, we were very careful to seed in some things Jeez. in the lore glossary that surfaced prominently in different editions. <laughs> like the Raven Queen, for instance, right. um, was a big figure in fourth edition. And she yeah, gets an entry in the lore glossary. Yeah, the Sererak, who yeah. goes all the way back to yeah. Tomb of Horrors, first edition, he gets an entry in the lore glossary. So the fourth wholly new thing in the Dungeon Master's Guide that I haven't talked about yet is the Bastions chapter. I am very, very excited for this. I'm not. If, you've, if you saw the Bastion rules that went out in Unearthed Arcana... All right, so before we get into this, let me, let me just voice my opinion on Bastions. Um, I hate them. I hate them. Uh, I feel like I've gotten over this before, somewhere, somehow. Um, I, 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 from what I've gathered from reading about them is they, um, they're essentially like mobile homes, so to speak. They're, uh, you can conjure them and then go stay in them and set things to them. You can, um, it's essentially like a, a keep. I know in, in fifth edition, I would, and even in 3.5, I would give my players keeps. Uh, they, they'd help a kingdom out and that kingdom would give them like, a not quite a castle, but a, a large mansion that they would call a keep. And they would, they'd be able to rest there. They go there whenever they wanted. They rest there. They, store their items there without having to worry about anybody stealing them. Um, they could put workshops in there for them to, to, you know, use their free time to make things like potions, poisons, uh, weapons, armor, you know, stuff like that. Um, and they could even sell them. They could, they could have, they could like hire some, some staff to, to sell all of their stuff for them, you know? Um, and from what I gather, that's kind of what Bastion is, but like in spell form, is is the way it was explained in the uh, Unearthed Arcanda and the the patch notes, right? Um, so, and if that's the case, I don't like that. I I can't stand that. Like, I don't know. I may maybe I'm just old fashioned. Maybe I'm the odd man out here, and I don't know. Maybe they changed it. Let's see. Last year, you got a glimpse of what to expect, but only a glimpse. Just a glimpse. Um... Uh, after getting feedback, we've made some refinements, some additions, um, had a bit of fun. And, oh, uh, of course, you didn't get to see any of the art or any of the other glorious the things that cool. are going to make this chapter wondrous to behold. That, that but is cool it is an lie. opt in because not every campaign is built um, for bastions. And it's really up to the DM whether or not to allow players to have them. Uh, based on the game Much like that you're running. Okay. It right. may be a great thing for players to get, and it may not work. Like a roving adventure that just spans a continent doesn't necessarily make sense to have a bastion. But exactly, a bastion yes. is a great narrative hook yes. for a group of adventurers who want to maintain a keep, a tower. Precisely, yes. If your campaign okay. is structured in such a way that the characters can have a home base, then bastions will work beautifully. Okay. Uh, and so bastions is... While the word is new to our lexicon in D&D, um, it's built on a very old concept because even going all the way back to the earliest editions of D&D, there were rules for building strongholds. Yeah. Yeah. Often you didn't get access to them, though, until yeah, you were much sure. higher level. So it, the reason why people didn't get access to building strongholds and keeps is because they can get complicated, right? A lot of Dungeon Masters didn't want to learn how to do it. The, this was like back in 2nd edition, 3rd edition, 3.5. Um, it was such an unused thing that they kind of dropped the rule for four point uh, for a fourth edition, and I don't recall there being a ruling for it in fifth edition. So people who allowed it just went went off of the three point five ruling. Uh, but it it got complicated. It complicated things fast. It made it so that they the, your players really didn't want to go outside of a certain area because well our strongholds back there. I don't want to travel a month over here to go do something and just have to travel a month back to get to my stronghold, right? 
Uh, which makes sense. It does, but a lot of that's the reason why a lot of DMs didn't allow for strong pulls is because they complicated things. They didn't, they couldn't be bothered to learn the rulings properly, which is fair. It's fair. There's, there's, there's enough rules at all already with not having to rule memorize rules like that that don't always matter. We have designed the Bastion system in the Dungeon Master's Guide so that characters can start building their Bastions at level 5. Oh, wow. Um, which is a nice worry. sweet spot in adventuring. You've got some experience under your belt, you've got some yeah. cash, uh, and you've got some fame yeah. <laughs> to throw around. Uh, so at level 5, with your DM's consent, the characters can start building their Bastions. And these continue to grow over the life of your adventuring career. But the magnificent thing about them is you can, you basically run them as kind of like a separate little activity. It does not stop you from being an adventurer. Yeah. Your adventurer can go around saving the multiverse, you know, run off to the Nine Hells or run off to the Feywild, do what you have to do. Once your Bastion is up and running, it is kind of a self-sustaining unit. And it's the players who run the Bastions. So every player is in charge of their own bastion and their own bastion's maintenance. Okay. And there are these, um, this mechanism called the bastion turn, which activates whenever the DM basically says, okay, your bastion now take a bastion turn. You don't even have to be home uh, for your bastion, for something to be happening yeah. in your bastion. What's okay. fabulous about this is that not only does it give players a safe harbor, a home base, it gives them access to resources that they can't otherwise get necessarily as their characters. Um, your bastion can furnish you with things that you might not be able to get elsewhere. Uh, you can issue orders to your bastion, yeah. and those orders generate things. There's a craft order that you can issue to your bastion so your bastion can make things. There's a harvesting order. If your bastion has certain facilities that allow you to harvest things like poisons and herbs and other things, uh, you can you can get access to stuff. Which is that fantasy? Like that, the fantasy. Uh, I, the first time I made a D and D character, I started thinking about like, well, what if I had a tower, or a inn right. that was running this whole time? And yes. What if I did have some minions or whatever? As exactly. Things you progress issue... because that's what you would daydream about. Right. So it's like yes. a mini game for that. Yes, and you can recruit to your bastion. Um, you can find creatures to inhabit your bastion. Uh, there's all kinds of fun, many activities built around this idea of issuing orders to the bastion while your characters are away or while your characters are there. If you're there, great. Uh, you can actually make things in your bastion. Every dungeon is a bastion that went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. And if you, if, you, if you like your adventuring colleagues and you want to combine your bastions into one uber bastion, you yeah. can do that too. Um, you're each individually still in charge of your piece of it. Right. But there is certain advantages to unifying your bastion. One of them being you can share its defenders, um, yeah. which, which has uh, definite advantages. Uh, so all these, all these op opportunities are now opened up to players that they didn't have before. Bastions are a chance for players to, to carve out a piece of Okay, so I think I wildly misinterpreted the, the uh, Unearthed Arcana notes that talked about bastions. The, the way they explained it here is a lot more interesting and a lot more acceptable, in my opinion, than what I read in the in the UA notes. Um, this seems fun. Uh, I'll probably allow it in most campaigns, to be honest with you. Um, it, I think the, the, the Bastion turn is, is a neat idea. That way you're, it's not just sitting there collecting dust that you forget about until 10 sessions later when you go back to it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I still, I'm still not 100% sure on how I feel about Bastions, but the way they described it, the way they, they go over how it works just in, you know, a little bit, I'm willing to give it a try, see how it works in campaign, you know, in actual practice, not just on paper. It sounds like a fun, uh, mechanic. So, yeah, I approve of their world and make it their own. Um, and and really, the, the DM's control stops at the walls of the Bastion or the outer boundary of the Bastion, whatever that is, um, so that the players can can get a taste of being in the DM seat and telling their own stories uh, of, of what things unfold with this cast of characters that inhabit their Bastion. Um, 
and, and have a place they feel like is home. It's like with the, the illustrations of the species in the player's handbook, we wanted to show what are characters fighting for. Mm -hmm. Bastion kind of makes that a reality throughout a character's career once they establish this place. Like, I'm not just fighting for my own self-interest. I've got people at home that I want to protect. Um, I've got a place that I care about. Um, it, it sort of ups the emotional stakes in the game. The players are essentially DMing their own microcosms within the larger campaign, um, uh, giving identities to their hirelings in the bastions, um, triggering events that yeah. happen in the bastions and seeing the results and consequences of those events. That's a very um, DM side of things. Uh, so I love the idea that the bastions are in the Dungeon Master's Guide because in effect, it's allowing the players to get a taste of what DMing is like. Yeah, it's very sneaky. Yes, it's a wonderful out of game activity. Yeah. Oh, like, it's a great mini game. Yeah. Just to date when you're when you're you know if the session has to be canceled or whatever and you yeah. can't play tonight or whatever, that's okay. Your DM can just say, "Everybody, take a Bastion turn." Yeah. Send send the message. And then off the players the go, and they just let the DMs know what they what their Bastions did on on that particular turn. It's it's a fabulous sort of game within a game. I love yeah. that. I'm hoping that um, that when DMs and players really start to interact with it and visualize their bastions, I'm hoping that they send me like maps and pictures of the bastions that they built. And that again, that's a all right. You heard him. You uh, send him all your maps of, and and whatnot of your bastions. He wants every last one of them. So flood him, flood his email. We'll find it. We'll find it. Flood his email. Another thing I felt myself immediately doing, well, I had to draw out every little thing, like this is what my wizard tower looks like, or yes. this is like the inn that got hunted by a vampire looks like. Right, yes. In Ravenloft, like that was always the, the worst hook I would do to my players. I would give them property in Ravenloft. Oh, see. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it comes cheap, but dimension. I mean, yeah. yeah uh, the mortgage is very low. <laughs> <laughs> so are the interest rates. It's like, how many people died in this house? Oh, don't worry about it. Why put a number on things? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, and um, and because we want the Bastion system to play nice with the rest of the Dungeon Master's Guide too, there are references to Bastion elements in other parts of the book, like the the Greyhawk campaign setting in Chapter Five tells the DM good places where characters can set up their Bastions. And then we have just a massive treasury, I mean tre treasure section. Yes. So as in 2014, the biggest chapter in the Dungeon Master's Guide is the treasure chapter. Loot. Loot, yes. <laughs> um, magic items are typically the purview of the Dungeon Master, which is why magic items end up in the Dungeon Master's Guide, yeah, even great. though players access oh, and play with them a lot. And so just like we're doing with the spells in the player's handbook, every magic item is getting, you've got a little hairy eyeball. Uh, we took a look at it, we made some refinements to eyeball. it. We stuffed even more magic items into the chapter good, good, to address good. certain holes or gaps that we'd identified. Um, for instance, there in the 2014 DMG, there weren't a lot of common magic items, mm, so yeah. we imported a few. We also saw opportunity to squeeze in some, uh, shall we say, nostalgic delights. Uh, in celebration of 50th anniversary, including things like uh, magic items used by the kids in the D&D cartoon. Perfect. Hank's energy bow or Diana's quarterstaff. Uh, Eric's shield, Bobby's club, Presto's hat. Of Uni's horn. No, not Uni's horn. <laughs> Kelly, <laughs> Kelly Uni, got her. Uni gets to keep her horn at least <laughs> for a bet. Um, and uh, one of the items was already in there, of course. Sheila's cloak and visibility has been in the game a long time, but yeah. it felt long overdue to get the other items stuffed in there as well. Um, we've we've sort of opened the door on some items as well. Uh, for instance, flame tongues are an example of a weapon that used to be very limited to the type of weapon you could apply it to. Yeah. We've now actually broadened that. So you could have a flame tongue great club if you want to, yeah. or a flame tongue halberd. Um, uh, so just looking for ways to surprise and delight, even in existing items. I need more trick arrows. Mm. Oh, I will spend a lot of money on trick okay. arrows. Yes. Uh, the arrow of slang is became the ammunition of slang, of which the arrow of slang is but one. So if you want sling stones of slaying, or bolts of slaying, or bullets of slaying, now...
He's talking about bullets, which means that they're still going to incorporate firearms into D&D. &D, which is cool. It's great. We love it. My problem is, I've got the 2024 Player's Handbook, and there is no artificer. Uh, there is no firearm proficiency, because the firearm proficiency goes to the artificer. Don't don't get my hopes up like that. Don't give me don't give me firearms and bullets if you're not going to give me my artificer class, right? Uh, the artificer class is so fun and I'm mildly irritated that it didn't get carried over into the 2024 player's handbook. Uh, that being said, I'm hoping that there's some way in this DMG that tells you how to transfer it over to uh, to the 2024 rules. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to figure it out myself, and I'll let you guys know. But he brought up bullets. They brought up... There's firearms. I, I don't know what I did with my book, but I know that there's firearms in the item section, the equipment section of the 2024 Player's Handbook. Fingers crossed they bring the Artificer back real soon. Though That is baked in Perfect. to the game. Because that's the, the other thing. This, The DMG, the Player's Handbook, all the new core rule books are really opening things up for the multiverse of D&D, and that can mean laser guns, or that can mean you know, weapons that use ammunition like bullets and stuff yes. like that. Like, so you have, because we're talking about Eberron, we're talking about you know, Expedition to Barrier Peaks, uh, or Spelljammer, like, this is a broad set of magical items and fantasy yes. that you're yeah. supporting in this one. Right. And just giving, just giving, allowing more variety in the world, because variety is richness, and, you know, the d d is many, many worlds. And, and there are uh, prices. Well, there, there always were, but uh, in, in the 2014, you could, you, could, you could divine the cost of a, yeah. of a rare item or a very rare item. We've made that a lot clearer this time oh, around. Good. Good. By by fronting, hey, here's here's how item how, here's how my, magic items are costed. Yeah, um, we've also taken another crack at um, the crafting magic items rules. How do you a player? Uh, how do rather how do you a character craft an item of your own with your DM's consent, of course. Right, that's extremely exciting for yes. a lot of people. Yeah, because then you take ownership of a magical item, yeah. potentially <laughs> no, that you made wonderful. yourself or yes. any item. It's been Crafting has always been an underutilized thing, and I know I know they did a video on crafting, and I'll probably cover it shortly. Um, but crafting has always been an underutilized thing that, that you know, your background had you doing something crafting related, but then you never craft throughout the entire campaign because there's no set rules for, or there are no there are no clear set rules for crafting. So the dungeon master has to try and figure out exactly how they want to incorporate crafting into their world. So by the sounds of it. They're coming out with specific rulings on it to clear up any confusion that there may have been before. And that's great. And it sounds like they're even going to give us a way to craft magical items, which is even better. It's been fun to try to shoehorn more items uh, to make items more fun and then to um, open up the possibilities for crafting magic items in this new version of the treasure chapter. And is the crafting system also in the player's handbook, or is it only the DMG? That is a great question. So the answer is yes. Um, there, is, uh, there is crafting magic items in the player's handbook, but it's limited to um, some very simple potions and scrolls. Okay. So you can create a, a low-level spell scroll, or you can create a potion of healing or some other low-level potion. Yeah. The rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide are broader and Good. encompass more variety. Good. I'm looking at the new Dungeon Master's Guide cover art. It's very charming and on purpose having like War Duke and Venger up front. Like this is who you are as the, the Dungeon Master. Not only to show them a good time, but you are the one who embodies the villains. Yes, uh, we, that was very deliberate. Whereas with the player's handbook, we wanted to show sort of an iconic group of heroes and a gold dragon to celebrate the golden anniversary of D&D. With the Dungeon Master's Guide, like you say, Todd, the, um, the Dungeon Master is about playing the villains and the monsters uh, more often than not. And uh, for the 50th anniversary, it seemed uh, absolutely fitting to tap into some of the most, I guess, iconic, nostalgic villains in our huge rogues gallery of villains. Uh, I've always had a fondness for the cartoon series. I grew up with the cartoon series. 
Uh, many people don't know Venger, they don't know Warduke, and they don't know Skilla, and I want them to. <laughs> it's also a bit of the aesthetic for the art the for the DMG, that. because you are the one who runs the villains in these scenarios, so the art, you know, it's not focused on heroes right. as much. Right? Yes, it's focused on the threat or the, the danger. So if you want the creepiest art, you need the Dungeon Master's Guide. <laughs> well, certainly with this Dungeon Master's Guide, we wanted it to feature the villains and locations and places of of D and D, um, because the Dungeon Master's Guide not only do they bring villains and monsters to life, they also bring settings to life, worlds to life, and so we took great care this time around to make sure that we have lots of art showing bad guys and places, um, so that you get sort of the full range of the multiverse. And you and I now have talked, have batted around this multiverse word a few times. Um, how important is the multiverse to D&D? It's oh, extremely important. Yeah, yeah. No, it is the default the setting for D&D. Yeah. It is all of our worlds. It is all of... Yeah, the, the concept of multiverse is probably one of the most important things you can wrap your head around when being a DM and when making your own uh, campaigns. It is the crux of Dungeons and Dragons. There's multiple universes, and they are all connected in some way or another. And that's a good thing to remember, because that means you can go to different planes of existence. You can go to different universes and still come back to your base universe if your players can figure out how. It is it is a very important thing to, to remember when building a campaign. The worlds that our fans create, they are all part of this multiverse, and they are all welcome, Absolutely. and they are all important. So in our art this time around and in the books themselves, in the text, we wanted to drive that point home. Good. That the multiverse is our setting, and look, it's magnificent to behold. Um, that we have an old, a whole chapter on the cosmology of D&D, which talks about the worlds of D&D and the planes of existence that are out there yeah. waiting to be explored. Uh, we tried to make them more beautiful this time around. We tried to oh, is, give you even more useful more information beautiful. as a dungeon master about some of these places while still making it clear that, hey, you're the DM. What you show of the multiverse is entirely up to you. Perfect. We haven't talked a lot about the tracking sheets. Yeah, tell me about the tracking sheets. One of the fun new features that sprinkled through the 2024 Dungeon Master's Guide are these delightfully charming. Ooh tracking sheets that uh, not only do we put in the books as kind of like a show and tell to show you what we're what we mean um, but also we're going to make them uh, downloadable off of our website so that you can just print them out and nice. put them in whatever you use for your campaign journal and these sheets are designed to help you keep track of important information in your game or in your campaign. Nice. If you want to create a new NPC, there is a sheet that we give you that you can oh. use and write on to capture so important many information NPCs. about That's that great. NPC. And it's presented That's in a great. very clean, elegant way. Um, there is a sheet that you can use to build uh, settlements like towns and villages. Uh, there's a sheet players can use to keep track of important information about their bastions. Uh, okay. There is a sheet you can use as a DM to keep track of the magic items that you've dispensed oh. to the party in the course of the campaign, to keep track of um, important character way, information way so that uh, you have some information about the characters in the party readily accessible to you as a DM behind your screen um, so that when you're planning adventures, you can remember you know, things about the characters' backstories that might tie into greater plots in your campaign. Uh, there's a sheet that you can use to track major conflicts in your campaign and then update them accordingly. And then I think most importantly, or the sheet that I find most useful, is the session planner sheet, where you know you've got a game session next week. You can write down the key beats of what you think is going to happen, key characters, make notes and other things. These sheets are um, beautiful. Uh, I think they're compelling. Uh, I think a lot of DMs will want to use them or want to create versions of them. Uh, and they have charming little illustrations of monsters on them, which I think are absolutely delightful. Baby monsters. <laughs> Everyone loves baby monsters. Baby monsters, yeah. Uh, so they're, they really are quite charming. And I think that um, in addition to things like the lore glossary and the poster map, uh, I think that, that is, these that tracking is... sheets will be... Look at that baby plump. 
Yeah, alright, that's adorable. I can get behind that. Um, this is this is gonna be great for, for people who enjoy making their own campaigns. I mean, this is gonna be great for any DM, uh, but especially those of us who primarily just homebrew all of our campaigns. Um, uh, I've got mild OCD, so I've got, like, six different notebooks. Uh, this is, I think this is gonna help me cut down on notebook costs, <laughs> for sure. Um... This is going to be a wonderful thing for everybody. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of people's uh, uh, tracker sheets. Uh, I'm thinking about making a, a Discord server for all of my lovely subscribers. And if I do, I would look very forward to, to seeing your guys' tracker sheets. And I'll obviously post all of mine, too. This is... I love the thought of this. I really do. They are really... Really pulling out all the stops when it comes to trying to help new DMs and, just, and veteran DMs, but mostly new DMs. Uh, this is fantastic. I love it. One of the most endearing and always useful parts of the book. Now, I haven't talked about the first three chapters of the book, Todd. That's my fault. I am a terrible interviewer. Yeah, you are. <laughs> well, tell, me about the, tell me about the first few chapters of the book. Chapters one, two, and three are uh, super important. Okay. And we sure. put them at the front of the book because they're super important. <laughs> that's sure. that's um, a good structure. Chapter one is called The Basics. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, it, it is a short chapter. Yeah. Um, primarily aimed at uh, DM curious folks. Folks who haven't DM'd or haven't DM'd much and are curious to really kind of dive in and sink their... It may be geared towards new DMs or people who are thinking about wanting to DM, but also I know a lot of veteran DMs that would significantly benefit from rereading the basics. Uh, I don't know what this particular chapter has, says, but if it's anything like the 2014 DMG, uh, it, it would be useful for most DMs, including veteran DMs, especially veteran DMs who haven't read the rules in a while. Um, it's never a bad idea to take a refresher course. I do it from time to time, too. We all, we all need it sometimes, right? So... He says it's geared towards new DMs or DM curious people. Even if you're a veteran DM, when you get this book, please, 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 please read the basics. It's okay to have a refresher course, but also a lot of rules are changing. They may be changing just slightly, but a lot of rules are changing. They're putting in a few new rules. Please read the basics. You don't want to get caught with your pants down, especially since I know you have at least one rules lawyer at your table. Fruit for thought. Their teeth into the DM role. Right. What do I need to play? How do I get my players together? Um, what's the first steps, basically? Uh, what is this DM screen, and what the heck do I do with it? Um, very, very basic. Let's 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 set the table. Here's your first day as a as a dungeon master. Yeah. If you're even thinking about being a dungeon master, these are the things that you you want to think about. And um, this is just some baseline information that will be super super valuable to you. And then when we, we quickly segue out of there into chapter two, which is called Running the Game. And it is literally that. Uh, it includes a, a sample walkthrough of play. There are similar things in the, in the player's handbook, but this one is more aimed at the dungeon master. It has very basic but tried and true advice on creating a fantastic experience for your players and for customizing the experience for the players that you have which I think is super key to being a successful dungeon master. It's not enough just to necessarily run a published adventure and hope that the players get everything you want out of it. You have to think about who's around the table and make sure that you're delivering an experience that everybody's going to enjoy. And so this, this chapter is focused on um, helping the DM actually run a fun game. And I think that... Even if you are in a very experienced DM, there's going to be something in here that's going to make you go, oh, well, yeah, I should totally be doing that. Uh, how do you bring uh, foreshadowing into play and mm. make that part of your game? Uh, you may be an experienced dungeon master, but you haven't had a lot of experience with a certain aspect of the game, and this, will, this chapter will help you with that. How to look like a genius. Yeah. 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 No, I, I couldn't agree more. That goes, that goes back into what I was saying. You know, even if you're a veteran dungeon master, dog... Puppy dog, could you stop scratching yourself? Thank you. Sorry, my dog was being loud. Uh -huh. that, that goes with what I was saying about the the basics. You, you, even if you're a veteran dungeon master, you need to be reading this. 
refresher courses are are always a good thing they're always a fantastic thing so i will always always shepherd i will always always recommend refresher courses and rereading especially once again since this is a new dmg there's new rules there's rule changes like absolutely no matter what your dungeon master experience is you never know too much to do a refresher course yes. how, how, how to convince your players that it was your plan all along yeah um, <laughs> that kind of thing um uh, i've often written articles about things like the invisible railroad is how do you keep an adventure moving toward its toward a destination while not making the players feel like they're trapped on a railroad and have no power to yeah. alter what's going on around them. Um, the, the running the game chapter is all about creating best play experiences. And so it's super valuable both to new and experienced DMs. Absolutely. In chapter two, we started off with a section called running combat. It talks about rolling initiative and tracking position on the grid and, and, and that sort of thing. And we've always had a section called running combat. What we didn't have is a section called running interaction or a section called running exploration. Now we have both of those. Good, good, good. Um, they're not as extensive as running combat because yeah, well, it's the nature of It's okay that they're not as extensive as, as running combat. The fact that we have them now is great because as, like you said, we didn't have it before and that was something that tripped up a lot of new DMs and it kind of like poisoned the well for the rest of the campaign. Um, and made a lot of good DMs not want to run a second campaign because they had so much trouble with interactions or explorations. So any little bit is going to be great. Um, and I'm very happy that they decided to add this. For the game, that those things are more about the conversation between DM and players, really entirely in the case of interaction and um, more so in the case of, of exploration. Um, but. One of the things I added into that running exploration section is uh, a different approach to overland travel or any kind of long journey that characters make that not only sort of streamlines the process of running a long journey, but also helps the DM plan for a journey so that it's not just a matter of, I'm gonna roll an encounter for every day of travel, but rather you're thinking of this, the different stages of the journey, how they unfold as a narrative, and what are the obstacles that the characters have to overcome in each of these uh, journey stages. So like that, that helps my narrative brain think about um, handling a long journey in the middle of an adventure or an adventure that is a long journey. Um, it, it might be that one of these stages ends at a ruin that the characters are gonna explore, or, or that's their destination at the end that is the, the dungeon that is the centerpiece of the adventure. It, it's, it's a relatively minor thing, but I, it really came together nicely, and um, I think DMs are going to find it a huge help for part of the game that is often over. I can't get over this mind flare whispering into this giant's ear. This is like the second or third time they've shown this picture, and it gets me every time. It's, I mean, what a mind flare would never just whisper into a giant's ear to, to get him to do something. It's just, you know, use its, its mental magic on it. But still, it, it's it's funny. Um, <laughs> anyway, he's right. Every Everybody has some trouble with, with interactions and explorations. And, you know, the fact that they're going out of their way to make sure that we don't have these problems anymore is absolutely wonderful. And... I can't praise it enough, you know? Overlooked or neglected or um, not really understood. When we get to chapter three, chapter three is a weirdo. Um, so after we had, after we dispense with the advice on how to run a great game, and before we get into conversations about creating your own adventures and creating your own campaigns, there's a bunch of topics that have to be covered that sure. don't really, that are so, that are very situational. Traps, how poisons work, siege engines, um, uh, information about um, NPC building, a bunch of miscellaneous, a bunch of these miscellaneous topics that the 2014 DMG covered, but they were sort of scattered. Right. Everywhere. So these the are book. the building blocks. Yes, this is a good way to look at it, building blocks. We call chapters three, we call chapter three the DM toolbox because it's, it's just this cyclopedia of miscellaneous parts. 
Toys. Toys that can come up in play. Um, and we organize that alphabetically by topic. So it is this alphabetically topic. topical listing of different things. You need more information about curses and how curses work. There's a section on curses. Um, hazards, All right. All right. green slime, yellow mold, brown mold, some new ones, uh, fireball fungus. No. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's all in the hazards focus. section. It's a very well organized grab bag of miscellaneous topics that come up in games all the time. And I adore that stuff. Uh, I, in the uh, some of the Dungeon Master screens, there's a scale of damage. Like, what if you know? What if the you fell off a mountain? Damage. Yes. Yeah, what if a meteorite fell? And here's the damage that I found so helpful. Yes. <laughs> then yes. making it my, myself, it also was a nice point of. Like here's a really fun hazard to present to the players. Yeah, you know because there, you know, too often you can think about like thinking about weapon damage and spell damage, but what happens when an avalanche hits you? What then? So that's that sounds like that entire chapter is that. Yeah, and so that's that's the book all all told. You've got uh, it starts off um, with the fundamentals, then goes into the esoteric, and then it goes into the create your own stuff. And then it goes into the, the treasure and bastions, the goodies. This is an entirely new book. It is, it is taking the, the wonderful bits of the 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide and resorting them and blending them in a way with new stuff that does, in fact, turn it into a new book. The, the 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide was kind of a... I use the word toolbox a lot. I love talking about that. That's what I love to do is provide Dungeon Masters with a big box of tools and toys that they can take out and that do stuff with. Right. The 2014 Dungeon Masters Guide was too much that. It was no. like just a big toolbox I, with... I would have to completely disagree with him. I felt like there was next to no tools in the 2014 DMG. Um, it, it was very much like, a, hey, here's roughly how you want to do things. Um, figure the rest out on your own. Have fun. And uh, it was it was a series of pitfall traps for new DMs. I know my first campaign was uh, rife with issues because I, I didn't know what I was doing. The, the 2014 DMG was kind of just really bad at teaching you how to do things. Um, it, it taught you the rules and it, and it gave you a rough guideline on, on how to run your campaign. But aside from that, it, it wasn't a toolbox. It was... It was um, it was a screwdriver set, you know. You can go go to Home Depot and buy a screwdriver set. It's got eight different sizes screwdrivers. Four of them are Phillips. Four of them are, are flatheads. That's what the the twenty fourteen DMG was. That's not a toolbox. That's a handful of tools. Now, don't get me wrong. They're tools that you can use for most jobs, but it's not a toolbox. I can do most jobs with a pair of pliers, right? You know, needle nose, preferably. But that doesn't make it okay. This sounds like... The 2024 DMG sounds like an actual toolbox with a cavalcade of tools, not just screwdrivers. So I, I have to vehemently disagree with him about the 2014 DMG. It was, in my opinion, not a toolbox. Not enough direction and... and um guidance for how to use this stuff. Yeah. So the 2024 DMG starts from the very beginning, from the, the foundation of what it means to be the Dungeon Master's Guide. What are the roles that you take on at the table? And how do you wrangle your friends together to, to play this game? And, um, and what's the nature of your interaction with them? And, and really, uh, you know, we, we spend time in the Player's Handbook telling you how to play, and that this is fundamentally a narrative game where you're it's all in dialogue, um, and and the DMG pulls the curtain back a little bit to show you what's going on inside the dungeon master's head while that, all that is happening. So, we're we're teaching you really from the beginning. How do you do this? This amazing, awesome, uh, terrifying uh, task of of running the game. This has to be very exciting for you. Uh, it. All right. The rest of Spud looks at it is just going to be their opinions um, and you know whatnot. So, this video has got me excited about the 2024 DMG. It sounds like it's going to be more useful than the 2014 DMG. Um, I do, like I said in the beginning, I do heavily recommend all Dungeon Masters read this start to finish. Whether you're a new one, whether you, you're thinking about being a DM, or you're a veteran DM with over a decade experience like me, 
I still heavily recommend reading it start to finish just just to learn some of the new rulings the uh, the the tweaks to the old rulings you know everything it's it's not gonna hurt you to read it um, and it, it sounds like it's going to just drastically benefit anybody who does because they've added a lot of useful tools to your to your toolbox you know uh, and you can never have too many tools too many hooks you know stuff like that so i'm very excited for this um let me know what you think in the comments below and uh, as always thanks for watching